Ladies and gentlemen, kicking off the first stop on his world tour, our new president and prophet, Russell M. Nelson! You say you want some revelation, well here you go. It's gonna blow your freaking mind. Greetings, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the weekly Mormon News Roundup. I'm your humble host, d talent on loan from Kolob. I'm bringing you this podcast with half the Kinderhook plates tied behind my back. My crew and I ruminate weekly on the great and spacious Beehive. So thanks for much, so much for joining us to discuss the latest current events in Mormon. We've got a great episode on tap for you. It's October 29th, 2023. We have the church and climate changes in the news once again. And Mitt Romney, he's in the spotlight. We're going to tell you all about that. Uh, we're going to give you a great report from the Faith Matters Conference and some of the controversies that were associated with that, which just took place at the Sandy Expo Center in Utah. And finally, we're going to give you some uh, temple updates. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, I'm at uh, mormonnewsroundup.org. You can send me an email to www.colob at mormonnewsroundup.org. I'd like to invite onto my program, uh, Dr. Patrick Mason. Hello. Welcome to hey, the program. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Well, it's tremendous. Now, may I call you? Uh, may I call you Patrick? Yes, please do. <laughs> oh, that sounds tremendous. Now, uh, Dr. Mason, Patrick, uh, for those who don't know your Mormon story, um, what is your one minute Mormon story? Who are you and what are you all about? Yeah, so I'm a, a lifetime uh, member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, born and raised in Utah, went to BYU. I, uh, I pursued a career as a historian of American religion. So I got my PhD at the University of Notre Dame, go Irish, and uh, I've spent my career studying American religion, but, but really focusing mostly on Mormonism and, and Mormon history. Uh, so that's taken me to lots of places around the country, around the world. Uh, I've had a position for a few years down in uh, Claremont, California. And then about four years ago, I came up to Logan, Utah, where uh, I'm a professor of religious studies and history, and I hold the Leonard Arrington Chair of Mormon History and Culture. Leonard uh, is looking over my shoulder uh, right here, uh, making sure I don't say anything too stupid. And uh, and I've written uh, several books, uh, some of which a few people have read. Well, that sounds tremendous. Thanks very much for coming on the program. You mentioned Leonard Arrington. If you say anything stupid, you would be demoted back to BYU. So that's not too, sh <laughs> that's not too shabby, right? That's that, pretty no, good. That's down the road. I've, I've got a lot of friends there. So, yeah. Yeah. And I have USU in my background. So I'm trying to put you at ease. And at I, I feel here, very right? comfortable. Thank you. Yeah. You have a great deal for a historian. Um, you have a great deal of interest in Latter-day News, uh, Latter-day Saint News. In fact, you had a program back in when you were at Claremont called Latter-day Landscape, which is previously Mormonism Magnified. This is a top Mormon news. It was between Patrick Mason and Morgan McKeon. Um, I hope I'm saying that right. McKeon. What was that all about? McKeon. Oh, sorry. Um, you know, I listened to a couple episodes. That's a lost gem there, Patrick. Uh, what was that all about? And, and why did you start that? Why did it end? It was really good. Well, that, that was really, I can't take much credit for it. That was really Morgan's brainchild. Morgan is a, a brilliant guy. Uh, he, he's in uh, marketing and uh, and he, he he's just a guy who who follows the news closely, cares a lot about uh, Mormonism. So we got to know each other when I was down in Claremont and he he came to me with the idea and said, hey, what if what if we did this this, uh, you know, semi regular uh, podcast that, that would focus on uh, some of the latest and greatest in, in the world of Mormonism? And uh, we bring on different scholars. So it wasn't just uh, uh, myself, uh, uh, but, but I'd bring on people who had expertise on, on the, whatever topics we were covering uh, that particular day or that particular episode. And uh, it, it was really good. I mean, Morgan put a ton of work into it. Uh, it was just one of those things. It's, you know, it's really hard to do this on a regular basis. Uh, so like hats off to anybody who's able to, to pull that off. We did it on a semi-regular semi basis and just for both of us, life got busy. And and I also moved up here to Utah State uh, and uh, uh, Morgan ended up uh, moving too. And so, you know, it, it just kind of fizzled out. But it was, it was a project that we were both really proud of. Yeah, it's definitely a forgotten gem. Highly curated. You brought your A-team. You had a lot of great people on the program. That's definitely something that I listen to and I try to emulate as best as I can. Now, this, this isn't your only foray into LDS news. You also had uh, this, this program here that you rolled out last uh, May, and it was Mormon News Weekly podcast. It was supposed to uh, be between you, John DeLynn, and Jana Reese, and you were supposed to cover um, all the topics in LDS news. 
And, uh, you know, when I remember when this came out, Patrick, I was really excited about it. I thought, oh, my gosh, you guys are going to put me out of business because this is you guys are so much smarter, so much uh, better audio, so much doing everything. I thought, well, that's the end of this podcast. Um, what was the moment this was all about? And um, why is it around it? Yeah, so so I, I'm really proud of what we were trying to do there, and it was good to see my uh, my beard that I had for a little while there. Um, but uh, you know, I I had gone on Mormon Stories, I don't know, a year, year and a half ago, and, and done a series of episodes with John, uh, and those episodes um, uh, turned out being to, to to be quite popular, and 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 I think had a, a really nice impact, and. And the main thing that people responded to was not necessarily the content of anything I said, but simply the way that John and I were able to have a long, uh, nuanced, uh, sometimes difficult conversation, but to do it with generosity, with civility. And, and that was the thing that, that struck people as much or more than, than anything we actually said. Is like These are two people who are clearly on very different sides in terms of their, their faith commitments at this point in their lives. And, uh, but, but they can sit down and have this long conversation and talk about hard things. And so John and I thought, you know, how could we maintain that model? What would it look like to, to keep doing that on a more regular basis? Uh, and, uh, and then we brought in our, our mutual friend, Janet, who's, you know, if, if people don't know her, she's one of the best reporters and journalists who, who writes regularly uh, about the church and the world of Mormonism. And so our idea was, was to model this. In some ways, the coverage of the news was kind of secondary. It was just the canvas that we were painting on. The thing that we were most interested in was just promoting uh, this kind of uh, civil dialogue and generosity and, and shared understanding. And it, it, it barely got off the ground. We, we, we did only two episodes. Uh, I think we, we made some strategic errors in terms of, um, of, of, I think we released it too early. I think the product wasn't quite ready. Uh, and also we, we didn't frame it, I think, as well as, as we could have. So that meant um, a lot of people, a lot of listeners, probably the majority of listeners uh, got what we were trying to do and appreciated it. Um, but there were a lot of people who didn't quite understand what we were trying to do. Obviously, uh, John's a polarizing figure. Uh, Jana has her critics. I have my critics. Um, and so I was the one who who pulled the plug on that project. It just um, it 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 uh, it became apparent to me that at least in the short term, it was producing more heat than light, which was the exact opposite of what we wanted to accomplish with that. So so with a lot of regret, but also feeling really good about what we were trying to do, uh, I, I pulled the plug, at least on my participation uh, in the project. Yeah, because if you go onto the Mormon Weekly News website now, those episodes have been taken down. They're no longer there anymore. And you released a very heartfelt uh, Twitter Twitter um, reaction to that, which really got a lot of views. I mean, this has got to be one of your most viral Twitter views. that has like 200,000 views in it. And there was just a great deal of response about the reasoning behind why you pulled the plug on this project. And there was a real visceral reaction to this Twitter um, to, to your tweets out about, you know, how, how peacemaking is tricky and it's taxing, but that you're not going to be a part of it. Um, is there any extra light that you want to shine about what happened with your reaction to this Twitter feed here and your attempted collaboration with Jana and uh, John Delenn? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm definitely going to keep uh, being involved in in peacemaking. That's, that's at the core of, of who I am, or at least who I want to try to try to be. And and in any effort at, at at trying to build bridges and 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 create bridges of understanding, you know, some things are going to work better than others. Uh, there's, you know, uh, uh, so, sometimes the timing isn't what right. Sometimes the the way that you approach it isn't quite right. Uh, and I I have um, just John and Jenna are both friends, and we've we've had great conversations. I'm I'm really grateful for for how gracious they were. When when I told them that that I felt like I had to step away from it, so I haven't stepped away at all from from the broader project of talking across difference, of of uh, engaging people you know who are in different places than I am. I think that's at the very heart of what it means to try to be a peacemaker. It's just this one particular project um, ended up uh, you know I, I I I basically went from feeling like it was the right thing to do to to feeling like it wasn't quite the right thing to do, or at least it, in that moment. Um, but, but, but I'm going to keep trying to do similar kinds of things in the future. 
Well, I just want to let you know, Patrick, that if you ever change your mind, I am here for you. Thank you. <laughs> but speaking speaking of engaging, yes, in the in the Mormon sphere, if you go into YouTube, you search for Patrick Mason and uh, Mormon, because there's a couple of Patrick Masons out there, obviously. I mean, you've appeared on just about everything. Mormon discussions, Mormonism Live, uh, 132 Problems, Faith Matters Foundation. Um, you, you've appeared on just about a quick media program. You've appeared on just about everything out there that a person could possibly appear on. Patrick. And, you know, a lot of folks in your position, I mean, you're tenured full, you know, you're a full professor tenured at a university. Why, you know, uh, well, you've appeared on a lot of podcasts, some of which you might even say are kind of conspiratorial or kind of offshoot kind of, we'll call them fringe, you know, and by the way, this is the pot calling the kettle black here. <laughs> As a beloved LDS scholar who, who's garnered a lot of respect both within and without the church and has published a lot of academic books and, you know, been in, in professional conferences, being on podcasts isn't exactly something that you put on your Vita. So so why bother being on these somewhat fringe uh, podcasts? Some, some of these podcasts only have a couple thousand views. Why do you bother going into the space when so many others don't? Yeah, that's, that's a terrific question. Uh a, a, a couple of things. So first of all, actually, you mentioned, you know, tenure. I'm, I'm a tenure professor. And and I believe that part of the purpose of tenure is to give you the kind of freedom uh, to do things that might be hard to do in other spaces. Uh, we can debate a lot about the merits of tenure and, and the way that it works. But, but I think part of the vision of it is precisely to allow intellectuals to, 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 to expand their reach and, and to do things that are maybe a little creative or a little outside the box. Um, and and so so I, I take that quite seriously. I, I also take really seriously um, the the role of of intellectuals to to get outside the ivory tower and and to talk with the the, the broader public. And and I think especially in this 21st century age, with all this digital technology, with podcasts and everything else, uh, you know, we're just in this uh, kind of golden age of being able to have these conversations across distance with lots of different kinds of audiences that academics just traditionally haven't reached. So 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 I want to kind of lean into that and, and embrace those opportunities when they come in terms of the, the, the range of, of podcasts and other things that I've done. I, I just really believe that that if people want to have good faith conversations, um, I'm willing to have the conversation that uh, I, I think one of the, the biggest challenges and, and frankly, problems that we have today is people only talking to people who they perceive to be already on their team or who already basically agree with them. And all that's done is create balkanization and tribalization. You know, the idea that conservatives should only go on Fox News, liberals should only go on CNN. Uh, the liberal Mormon scholar should only publish in dialogue. The conservatives should publish in BYU studies, right? And and ne'er the twain shall meet. And and I just I, I I just reject that kind of tribalism. And so so if somebody is interested in talking to me, if they, if they think I have something to to say or a kind of conversation that they want to have, if they want to do that in good faith, uh, I'm I'm going to have that conversation. I'm not afraid of talking to people. I, I I learn from people who are different from me. I hope that maybe they they learn from me as well. So I I think we need more conversation uh, rather than less, and and that's why I'm willing to to do some of these things. Well, thanks so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to appear on our humble podcast. I greatly appreciate it. That does take us to our Mormon News Joke of the Week. And I understand that you've got the Mormon News Joke of the Week here for us, Patrick. It's a uh, cartoon for those podcast listeners out there. What are we seeing? I do indeed. Yeah. So sorry for those who are audio only. This is actually something that was shared with me from a friend. This is not brand new. This came out a few years ago. But this is a, a, a cartoon with a guy standing at, at the gates of, of heaven, the pearly gates, and Peter is there or some angel uh, and says to the guy, you were a believer. Yes but you skipped the not being a jerk about it part. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so that's, I, good. Uh, that's, that's one of my favorite ever cartoons. So I wanted to share that with the, uh, share that with the audience here. Oh, very nice. I really appreciate that. We are going to hop into the news here for the week. And uh, the first uh, news article that we have is uh, church leaders urge care for the earth at the conference in Brazil. Elder Christofferson, Bishop Cause and the church's sustainability manager speak at this four day event. What were your takeaways from reading this article about what the church is doing here in Brazil with regards to sustainability and climate change, Patrick? Yeah, first of all, I was really glad to, to see that church leaders were in, interacting with this, this group of, of folks down in uh, Brazil. It's uh, that this is a really interesting group that's bringing together young people trying to, to think about young Latter-day Saints, young professional Latter-day Saints, and thinking about how their membership in the church 
uh, it can be part of their their broader stewardship in, in the world and in whatever careers they're they're following. So yeah, it was really interesting that you had Elder Christofferson, you had Bishop Cosse, uh, it sounded like zoom in uh, to, to the meeting. And that one of the big messages they were giving them very appropriate for Brazil, given the Amazon rainforest and and you know all the environmental issues that the center there is the importance of environmental stewardship. And you know, it was it was interesting to me a couple of things. So so first of all, uh, they they leaned into this message that as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, we have a serious responsibility to be good stewards of the earth, to be good stewards of creation, not to be wasteful, not to be harmful, uh, you know, not uh, you know, not to you know participate actively in ecological degradation and so forth. So so that that's encouraging to to hear senior church leaders talk openly and actively asking church members to think about what they can do in their lives to be better stewards of of creation. Um, but then on the other hand, or, and maybe it's not on the other hand, but it, but it, but but certainly a second part of the message was that the purpose of creation uh, is for humans, that the reason why God created the earth, the reason why God created the cosmos uh, is as a place for uh, for God's children, you and I, to come to learn to grow and to and to progress uh, towards eternity and towards eternal life, and so so there was um, a, a, a message that the environment is that care for the environment is not a good in and of itself, or or the the, the, the environment is 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 not just is not the preeminent good, but the but rather that that human beings that the creation is for humans. And so we then have a responsibility for creation. Now that may that's not a message that may satisfy some groups of environmentalists, but I do think it's consistent with our theology. Uh, so it's interesting to see the church leaders doing both of those things, both of a really strong environmental message while also saying that the human beings remain at the center of God's plan. Yeah, what I learned from this article that I didn't know before, and perhaps it's just my own ignorance, I didn't realize that the church had a sustainability manager, Danica yeah. Sedgwick. I, I wasn't aware of that before. And this also seems to be a bit of a departure from the church's previous, shall we say, somewhat neutrality on this issue, not really weighing in strongly in either for you know uh, sustainability or on behalf of businesses and in industry, for instance. I do wonder, Patrick, will there be concrete actions that would be like a donations or money or a commitment to objective sustainability goals, for instance, in reducing fossil fuel emissions or things along those lines that go along with the admirable sentiments that are expressed in this conference. Do you think that there's going to be something concrete as far as actions are concerned? Because, you know, talk is cheap when it comes to climate change. Yeah. It's actions that are very important. Well, we're, all, we're already seeing, and if you scroll down in the that article, if people scroll down, they'll see that, that the church actually outlined several of the initiatives that, that are already underway. And, and you're right, this is relatively new uh, in terms of the church's sustainability office. Um, but my understanding is that office does interact with with the with the various offices throughout the church, especially with buildings and and you know, the kind of obvious things. And so this points out a, a few different things. So they're going to increase energy efficiency. They're going to try to conserve water in terms of uh, in terms of their buildings and the land that, that they have, the landscaping around buildings and temples. They're going to reduce waste. Uh, it, it talks uh, kind of interesting about uh, for sacrament cups, they've uh, apparently they've shifted to, to something that will be 100 percent recycled plastic. Uh, and uh, they're going to improve air quality, reduce emissions. This is from the church's fleet, which when you think about it, the church has got to own tens of thousands of vehicles. And so in in increasing efficiency there can be really helpful. Um, they've already begun uh, 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 being mindful about sustainability and in, in terms of the buildings uh, that they they build. Uh, several of their major projects have you know really high uh, sustainability ratings. Uh, and then they talked about more sustainable farming and ranching practices. We know the church owns lots of land. Uh, and, and so and agriculture is actually a big driver of climate change um, and carbon emissions and so or methane and things like that. And so 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 I'm I'm heartened to see this. It's not just talk. Uh, I think we could probably all agree that the church, like almost every other big organization, could could go farther and faster 
uh, this is a true global crisis uh, that, that, that we need to address. I'm glad to see the church embracing this. We also saw that the church has, has made some really nice steps locally in terms of uh, donating uh, more water back into the Great Salt Lake, uh, which is a real local crisis, environmental crisis that we have here in Utah. So, so I think uh, we're in the very early phases of this. I'm cautiously optimistic that the church is going to lean into this even more in the next few years. Yeah, the church donated those 20,000 water shares to the Great Salt Lake, which was um, a, a great gesture. You yeah. know, there is a disconnect between what a lot of Latter-day Saints see, what, what a lot of climate scientists see and academics see as an existential threat, and what a typical Latter-day Saint sees as a threat. Uh, only 10%, we covered this actually, this came out from KUR last year, uh, last week. Only 10% of Latter-day Saints actually see climate change as a crisis, the survey finds. They're among the lowest of all religious denominations as far as feeling that Climate change is very important. And I just want to, there's one other thing that came out last year. If you remember, there was the water yeah. crisis that happened last year in Utah. The church said that they were going to um, let everything go brown and reduce the watering. Well, Axios did an article and they went and surveyed all of the church landscapes. And it turned out that more than 90% of the sites actually remained green and that the church basically kept the water on. So what, I, what I'm getting from that is we see the climate, the, we see a couple of different things. The church, the leadership, we have a sustainability manager. We're at the conferences. We are pledging some minor steps forward, but the regular Latter-day Saints who are in the pews, they don't see it as a crisis. And we saw from last year, two contradictory things. The church donating water shares to help the Great Salt Lake, that's bravo. But then when the church came to actual action of reducing its own watering, it fell short. So we're seeing a lot of different things. Any last thoughts on this one, Patrick? Well, I, I, I think you put your finger on it. What, what we see right now is is uh, some paradox and tension uh, between values and action. And look, this is hard. I mean, I, I don't live up fully. I'm, I'm, I'm committed to trying to be a good steward of it. I don't live up to my own values as well as I should. Um, and uh, so, so I think we, we can and should hope that the, the church will do more. Uh, but the fact is that, the, that we don't hear about this very much from the church so far in terms of existential issues or priority issues we 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 haven't heard about this a lot from the church. We can point to a few talks. Bishop Cosse gave a really nice general conference talk uh, last year uh, along these issues. But we need to hear about it more. We need to hear about it over sacrament meeting pulpits. That's tough because at least in this country, it's a very politicized issue. So there are, there are some parts of that message I wouldn't want to hear uh, over over the pulpit. I think this this just shows how difficult it is when when you're engaging in an issue that I think is truly a moral and even an existential issue for humanity, but an issue that's been politicized and the church uh, doesn't want to enter into much of that political territory on some issues like this. Uh, and so so we're seeing hesitation. Uh, we're, we're seeing not as much action as we could at the general level and church members being very divided. That, that 10% number, when I saw that, when that, cert, when that uh, poll came out, I was really disheartened by that because on the other side of it, uh, the Latter-day Saints were the highest uh, group of any that, that said that they have spiritual experiences in nature. Right. Right. So yeah. there, there's a, there is a deep care for nature, but that hasn't translated into action for most Latter-day Saints. And again, I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody there. Yeah, so we release all these episodes onto Apple Podcasts. We release them onto Spotify. If you can let us know your thoughts, what do you think the church should be doing with regards to climate change? Is this an issue that the church needs to take a more definitive action or steps on? Let us know your thoughts about what uh, the world should do with regards to climate change. We'd be very grateful for that. Now, next article here, Patrick, uh, you know, Mitt Romney, he has announced here, he's the uh, LDS senator in your home state there in Utah. Indeed. Uh, the, he, the senior senator there. He's announced that. Uh, Junior senator, not... actually. <laughs> oh, well, wait a minute. Oh, uh, Mike Lee is the senior. even though Mitt Romney's older, Mike Lee is the senior senator. So... Yeah, sorry, I got that wrong. You're right. Oh. Yes, I, I apologize for that. That's correct. Uh, I apologize. Yes. So Mitt Romney, you know, he, he he's not seeking re-election. He's probably one of the most politi politically powerful Mormon in the world, I think it would be safe to say that he's certainly in a handful of uh, folks. So, you know, when people think of uh, Mormons, a lot of them think of Mitt Romney. You know, he was the presidential. Uh, he, he, he came very close to uh, uh, getting into the Oval Office. He's been a governor. He ran the uh, 2002 Winter Olympics high profile. He's been a senator. You know, he's one of the only one uh, Republicans who opposed Trump. So he, he's very a lot of people think a lot of they say they think Mitt Romney. You know, he's kind of a poster child and he's a 
he, we've got this article that was released here um, about Mitt Romney, what he sees as the greatest threats to the LDS church. And I just wanted to highlight one little portion out of this here for you, Patrick, mm -hmm. and see if you agree with Mitt Romney. <laughs> it's a good thing you've got tenure, right? I just wanted to confirm <laughs> that you do. Okay, so no problems there. <laughs> uh, let me just read this for you and um, I'll get your thoughts on it. Is, is Mitt Romney correct with the threats to the church? He says, uh, the most pressing challenges in the global church of 17 million members came not from without, but within, namely retaining young people, promoting faith in a secular world, and addressing, addressing prickly issues in the church's history. Uh, Patrick, do you think that uh, Mitt Romney is right about those threats to the church? I actually do. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I completely agree with his, uh, with, with his kind of meta-analysis that the biggest threats to the church are from within rather than from without. Certainly, there, there are critiques. There always have been. Uh, uh, there, there are challenges from outside. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But, but, but I, I actually completely agree with him that at this moment, uh, that the greater dangers are from within. In addition to the three things that he listed, which I think are all quite real, uh, and, and I'm actually encouraged that he would name them in that way and, and, and seize it that way, uh, I would also add polarization. Uh, I see, especially over the last few years, uh, increased polarization within the church uh, with politics driving religion rather than the other way around. And uh, that to me uh, seems to be one of the greatest. And, and you know, we, we can point to lots of examples in the Book of Mormon and other uh, uh, other scriptures where uh, where the unity of the church is undermined, not so much by attacks from the outside, but but rather from polarization within. And, uh, and, and, and people uh, unable to find unity. So, so yeah, I, I think Senator Romney is right. And, uh, that's, that's what I worry about is what's happening inside. Yeah, I think uh, Mitt Romney is really quite spot on with this uh, particular analysis. If you think about uh, the church's re retention of young people, they don't release the numbers. Yeah. But if you go back to Mormon leaks, in the Mormon leaks back in 2013, we did have those briefings back to church headquarters. I know that's 10 years ago, but it said that up to 70% of young persons in North America, uh, it's about 70 to 80% of young persons do not continue on in the church when they are uh, when they become 18 years old. So that's probably gotten worse over time. And of course, Promoting faith in a secular world, I think what Mitt Romney is talking about is the rise of the religious nuns. Yes. The secularization of society, which is an insidious and persistent uh, uh, threat to faith, global faith in general, and also addressing uh, prickly issues of church history. The church has really acknowledged that again back in 20, uh, 2013, 2014, releasing the gospel topics essays, releasing the saints volumes. The church is trying to make strides to combat these uh, potential threats to the church. Is it doing enough? Um, or um, is it stemming the tide? What do you think? Well, it's 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 a mixed story to be sure. And and of course, when when he talks about secularization, people can say, well, obviously that's an, that is an external threat. Um, so so that's a mix of sort of inside and 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 outside. Uh, there, be, because simply the, the culture has changed, as as you said, the 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 largest growing uh, religious population or religious demographic in the United States are the, the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, the people who don't affiliate with any religion. Among Gen Z, that's probably, uh, the, the polls differ somewhat. Uh, certainly a plurality, maybe a majority of, of, of Gen Z. And, and the trend lines are, are just phenomenal. As, as a scholar of religion, it's fascinating uh, to, 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 to look at these trends and, and just how different they are from previous generations in, in uh, in U.S. history, but as a, as a believer, obviously, I'm I'm somewhat uh, troubled by that. And so, uh, so is is the church doing enough? Uh, I think uh, I think no. I think the church is trying really, really hard. The church knows these things. Senior leadership knows this. Local leadership knows this. I think part of the question is is what do you do? Um, right now, it, for, for, for the, there have been stretches in, in American history, I'd say in the mid to late 20th century, where being a religious person was, was uh, the, you know, the more respected option. You were sort of going with the flow. Uh, being Latter-day Saint was always, you know, to, to, to put yourself on the margins of society, but still to be religious, to say you believed in God, to go to church every week, that was, that was culturally respectable. Uh, now, to increasingly, and, and, and depending on where you live, uh, to, to be an outwardly religious person is to, to swim against the tide of culture. 
And so it's, I think it's right now, both church leaders at both the general and the local level are struggling to know what to do. We're seeing a lot of of talk at young people, you know, more firesides, more, you know, uh, you know, more talks from general authorities, more of these face-to-face -face events and so forth. So, so again, I, I think they're trying to get in front of young people a little bit more. I'm not entirely convinced that that's going to be the proper strategy. I don't, I don't see any data that that's sort of stemmed the tide. Uh, so clearly this is a conversation that they're having. These, this is a worry that they have. I don't think anybody in our church or other, every other church is facing the same thing. So it's not like Latter-day Saints are unique in this struggle. Um, quite the opposite. Everybody is having this struggle and nobody quite knows uh, how how to stop this rising tide of secularization. Yeah, when I think of, we see Mitt Romney is talking about the three great dangers to the church. That really harkens me back to the good old days of 1993, Boyd K. Packer, <laughs> where he said that uh, he had three different particular threats to the church back in 1993. He said that the greatest threats to the church were feminists, intellectuals, and gays. Uh, and I, you know, this is a tweet from a far right member of the church, of a thoughtful saint. A thoughtful saint. I had him on um, this podcast uh, not that long ago. He said that if you look at prophetic counsel, Elder Packer is right. He's spot on, and that Mitt Romney is wrong. That's maybe a right leaning reaction. I want to give you a left leaning reaction too. It says that history will prove Romney right and describe a small religious, uh, regional Christian like cult that tore itself apart from within as it struggled with relevancy. So is uh, Boyd K. Packer right or is Mitt Romney right? What's your final thoughts on um, uh, the danger to the current church? Well, my main thought is that the church isn't going anywhere. Uh, and uh, the church is going to be here for a long time. It's not going to be diminished to a small regional sect uh, that, that's irrelevant. Uh, that's just simply not going to be true. Nor is it true uh, that feminist gays and intellectuals ruined the church over the past 30 years. Uh, first of all, every church needs its intellectuals. Uh, uh, every church needs uh, a feminist uh, in, in terms of, uh, of, of people who speak strongly for, for the rights and equality of women. And of course, our LGBTQ brothers and sisters are, are fully members of the church and children of God along with the rest of us. So it's, it's hard to say that, that they are inherently some kind of threat to the church. I understand what, what uh, Elder Packer was saying back then. And we've seen some of those culture war politics play out in the church. That's that's part of the polarization uh, that that I that I see and that I was mentioning uh, earlier. I'm not sure that uh, that identifying certain groups and stoking uh, the the uh, you know the embers of culture wars is going to be the thing that makes Mormonism successful in the 21st century. Uh, I think if anything. Uh, thinking about the relevance and uh, leaning into the ninth article of faith, the fact that God continues to reveal things to us and the church may look different in the 21st century than it did in the 20th or in the 19th, uh, as God continues to reveal things to the church. Uh, that to me seems like a better way forward than identifying a bunch of enemies and, and saying that they're the problem. Yeah. Now we uh, release all these episodes also onto uh, TikTok. We have a TikTok channel for the Mormon News Roundup. We're on Instagram as well. If you want to come over, give us a reaction to your thoughts about Mitt Romney. Is he right about the threats of the church or is uh, Boyd K. Packer right to the threats of the church? Let us know your thoughts over there. We'd be very grateful for that. Now, uh, you brought up this uh, next article here and you were very much involved with this, Patrick, which was the uh, latest. Uh, you gave us this article here from Gordon Monson, Salt Lake Tribune, published on October 18, 2023. It says, if you're LDS and yearn for an inspired but less stuffy, more inclusive church conference i found one he called he said it's the restore gathering which lived up to its name restoring hope restoring faith and restoring love i know you were there patrick so can you tell us uh, about uh, what is this uh, faith matters restore conference which took place last week in sandy what is it why do people attend it and um, if you could also just what is your relationship with faith matters yeah, so full disclosure. So I'm on the board of advisors for Faith Matters. Uh, they've published one of my books. So I'm, uh, you know, pretty, pretty close uh, to that organization and believe in it very much. I think Faith Matters just does phenomenal work. I think it's doing the kind of work uh, to, to make Mormonism, uh, to, to continue Mormonism's relevance for many people in this century. Not everybody's going to resonate with what Faith Matters is doing. That's fine. Um, uh, but, but it's certainly a lot of people are resonating with it. And a lot of people, 
uh, th that I talk to and a lot of people who, who tune in to, to the content that Faith Matters produces talks about the ways that it energizes them, that it gives them hope, that it actually gives them some strength and, and kind of the juice they need to be better members of the church. Faith Matters isn't pulling anybody away from the church uh, that, that I know of. Uh, there might be some isolated cases, but, but for the, the, the purpose of Faith Matters, certainly the goal of the founders, the goal of all of the people who are involved in it is to strengthen people's relationship to Christ, strengthen people's relationship with the church, and and give them the tools they need to have relevant discipleship in the 21st century. So, so Faith Matters really stride. It, it started primarily as a podcast. Uh, uh, it's ventured into to other media, including books. Uh, and then last year, for the first time, uh, they did an in-person gathering. They'd hoped to do this earlier, but you know we had COVID and everything like that. So last year was the first time. Uh, that they did this. The, the organization only started a few years ago, so it's actually ramped up very quickly and, and expanded its scope in the in the space of just a few years. So we gathered uh, last year in Salt Lake City. Uh, about 1,500 people came. It was literally standing room only. The fire marshal <laughs> came and uh, wagged their finger at us a little bit, uh, and so so they decided we we need a bigger venue. So so they they rented out the Sandy Expo Center. So we had what I heard between 3,000 and 3,500 people who were there, every seat packed, two days of speakers, A-list people, everywhere from Governor Spencer Cox to, to NFL quarterback Steve Young to Brandon Flowers, the rock star. Uh, and then you had C-listers like me uh, uh, who were up there as well. And so, so two days of presentations, of music, of poetry, of art, uh, it really was a pretty phenomenal gathering. And the people that I saw and the people that I talked to who were there came out of it very, very energized. And just like Gordon Monson said, full of a lot more faith, a lot more hope, uh, a lot more connection to their faith and, and energy to, to go out and do good in the world. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I heard a lot of amazing things about the conference. It seemed to have uh, really resonated with some folks that are, uh, like uh, Gordon Monson said, that if you know, it's kind of your grandmother's stuffy religion. The, the stereotype about Latter Day, the uh, Latter Day Saints, is that it's kind of a stuffy your grandma's religion. You know, you don't have you know drums, you don't have excitement, you don't have you know, you don't get up in the pews and shake your hands and things like that. And Faith Matters is kind of turning that paradigm on its head and saying, you know, we can be more evangelical in our approach to religion, and that seems to connect with a certain portion of the population. I did want to bring up one um, take that also came out of the Salt Lake Tribune that was uh, somewhat critical of the Faith Matters, and, and get your reaction to this. Uh, this was from Paul Merrow, who said, Faith Matters damages faith by forgetting our sacrificial unity. Can I um, just read this to you and get your reaction sure. here? He said that Faith Matters reveals its breath of arrogance in assuming that its voice of diversity represents all perceived problems among church members. Speak for yourself. Your problems are clearly and ultimately within the Lord, not his servants or his church. I say that to this. Being faithful, practically speaking, plays out in our hearts and our minds on a continuum and is a unique experience for every person. But at some point, faithfulness needs to be faithful. Yes, faith matters, but not faith matters. The end goal of faith is not how unique we are. The end goal of faith is one heart and one mind able to bear celestial law, not a gospel of our own making. The answer to personal happiness is not found in 17 million differing ways to be happy. Happiness or joy only comes through living a celestial life. Think celestial, right? What's your reaction? Yeah, I I, I thought this was a strange take. Um, I, I It seems like the author was not there. Uh, so he was only responding to, to Gordon Monson's column. And so it's it's always a little strange to, to criticize something that you don't really know anything about. So I thought that was strange on uh, just on, on the first blush. I mean, I, again, Faith Matters isn't going to be for everybody. Uh, th th and that's to to totally fine. It's not trying to be a rival church. It's not trying to pull people out of the church. It's trying to energize people in their commitment to the church and to Christ. And so it's going to work for some, I mean, it's called Faith Matters for a reason. It is it is meant to to energize and build and sustain people's faith uh, in in the restored gospel. Definitely, I mean, part of its tagline or motto or or slogan is is to build a a more expansive and inclusive faith. I think in in connection with uh, with a lot of what we've we've heard from church leaders and from the scriptures uh, over over the years. Um, but but the fact that uh, that this author do doesn't find that particular style to be helpful that's that's completely fine. Uh, might be better though to 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 attend the conference um, and and know know what you're writing about, but before you criticize it though. 
I did find one meme that went along with this, and I'm a big meme guy, but I guess it's some of the music that uh, really seemed like from the reports that I heard, that seemed like the music really resonated with a lot of people and the fact that they had, you know, really powerful choirs and, and things like that. And I saw one funny meme that went along with that. Uh, you know, I know you're an academic, but hopefully you can appreciate a good meme from your Mormon joke. It says, hey, thanks, everybody. We'll see you again next year at Faith Matters, you know, because the the music. Um, <laughs> Uh, I find that to be amusing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hey, a couple last articles to take you out here. And uh, we're getting, uh, you know, there's temples are always in the news. Temples are very, very important to the church. And, uh, you know, especially with the last journal conference announcing 20 temples, really unprecedented. And one temple in particular seems to be causing a great deal of dust up. And that is the Cody, Wyoming temple um, is still in the spotlight quite a bit here. And there was some um, so, so from the Cody Enterprise founded by Buffalo Bill back in 1899. There was a. Um, you know, from FOIA requests, they discovered that this temple, which has caused a great deal of controversy in the small city of Cody, Wyoming, that the behind the scenes on it is even messier than what has happened in the public eye. And I just want to um, share one thing with you. Of course, as you as you know, Patrick, the church has brought a couple of lawsuits. There's at least four lawsuits associated with getting this temple put into Cody, Wyoming. And this is from the Freedom of Information request here. These uh, emails were... Um, just released not long ago in a draft report acquired through the Wyoming Records Act, the city planner Todd Stowell, who is an active Latter-day Saint, included a warning about potential legal consequences if the Volunteer Planning and Zoning Board decided not to approve the temple. And this is what he told the board members that would happen to them if they did not approve this temple into the town. It says, if you do not personally agree with the city attorney or my interpretation that the Cody Wyoming Temple of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints complies with the building height requirements of the Cody Zoning Ordinance, please prepare to be directly questioned in court to explain your logic and conclusion and why it is any more sound than presented by your staff, he wrote. This is not meant to be threatening, but simply letting you know the strict scrutiny to which your personal decision will be subjected. And so what, what, what we're finding out behind the scenes is that there is a huge amount of pressure put on these volunteer small board members in these towns to get this approved because the church is bringing serious legal uh, serious legal pressure onto this tiny community. And these, uh, these board members could end up being personally named in lawsuits if they don't approve the temple. That's why it's causing a great deal of angst in the Cody community. What is your reaction to what we've learned so far about the church in Cody, Wyoming? Yeah, so I have to say I'm I'm not an expert in real estate law. I'm certainly not an expert in the zoning ordinances of Cody, Wyoming. Uh, but based on the the reporting that we've gotten from local newspapers, which by the way, this is exactly why we need lo local journalism. The New York Times isn't going to cover this story. Uh, this is why we need local newspapers. But but my understanding is is maybe slightly different than your framing. My my understanding after reading the the, the reporting on it is that. The, the church had submitted its plan for the temple. It was approved according to the town ordinances, to, to the zoning ordinances. Uh, and But there are still members of the city council who were opposed to it, despite the fact that the church's original plan was, was approved. And so my reading of that statement um, from, is he the city planner? I, I forget what, ex what, what exactly his title is. Uh, is, is he said, city if, planner. yeah, ba th that it meets the requirements, right? It, it meets the requirements that the city council, that the zoning commission had already set. And now you're going to say they can't proceed anyway. That's why you should expect to, to see yourself in court. So, so it's not the, that the church is, is coming in and, and pressuring them to, to change their laws or to get an exception or something like that. The church is simply saying, wait a minute, you, you approved this. We worked within your own rules that, that you gave us. And now you're still telling us, no, we're going to go to court uh, to, 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 you know, to, um, to secure our rights within the rules and the zoning ordinances that you already have uh, within your town. So, so I think my reading of it, um, again, not claiming any particular expertise other than what I've read here, is is that the church is well within its rights to do this. This is what we do within within the American uh, system. I would love to see you know things like this settled outside of court. I'd like I'd like to see you know some some uh, more constructive mediation uh, and uh, you know f find a way for for uh, them. Th them to find some solutions that would make everybody happy. Sometimes that's not possible. That's why we have courts. Um, but but definitely the fact that this continues to be in the news and it gets dragged out, uh, it's just going to exacerbate tensions in the community. It's not good for anybody. It's not good for Latter-day Saints in, in Wyoming. It's not good for the church's public image. 
Um, so if if there were a way to to solve this amicably, uh, I, th I think that'd be the best solution for everybody. Yeah. Also released from these documents, we found out that the person who donated the land to the church, who's LDS, he offered a job to the city employee um, uh, almost as a bribe. It's, it's difficult to say if it's from the uh, other article that I brought up here, the court documents, Nielsen, who's the donor, offered Stowell, who's the city uh, the, the city planner. He offered him a job and said, you know, if there's any issues that come along with this, don't worry, I'm going to take care of you. So it seems like I don't know. It seems like the Latter-day Saints in this particular community in this, with regards to who is in city office and, and in power in this small community are not acting in the best light. And as these documents come to light, it just it continues not only in the Cody, Cody, Wyoming, also in the Heber Valley Temple. It is highlighting the difficulties that the church is facing in the 21st century, getting these massive structures approved in smaller mostly non-LDS communities. It used to be a piece of cake to get these approved. It's becoming harder and harder, as we saw in Erda, Nevada, that temple that was rejected back about 10 years ago. We also saw it in New York. It was in Harrisburg, I believe, where the church announced the temple in New York, and then that community rejected it. These things used to be unheard of, and it's coming more and more common for communities to push back against these massive structures, especially in small rural areas that are mostly non-LDS. The church is uh, receiving an icy reception. Yeah, I, I do think there's a longer history here. So it's not just in recent years. We can go back and we can see protests against temple construction uh, over the past several decades. Of, of course, most temple construction has happened uh, since the late 20th century. So this is a pretty recent phenomenon, especially with the pace of, of temple construction. And like you say, once you start building these very large buildings in fairly, fairly rural areas where the temple will probably be the tallest building uh, in, in a given locale, that's that's a different kind of challenge uh, than than building it. it. It's actually an entirely different challenge than building one in Manhattan or New York or Philadelphia. So so the the church is is facing these kinds of zoning and architectural issues on all sides. But it has faced problems before. It faced problems in in uh, Belmont, Massachusetts. It faced uh, challenges in in lots of places around the country. I do think I, I I didn't read that article as a kind of bribe from the the, the the landowner to or the person who had donated the land to the city planner. I read it more as a safety net of saying, hey, look, if you end up losing your job because of this, because of your conflict with the the city council, um, you know, uh, come to me and we'll we'll take care of you. Uh, uh, but uh, but again, uh, we, we, I I don't know as much as uh, as, as I could, and I'm I'm just reading the same article that everybody else is. Uh, but certainly. I think that the overall takeaway, as, as as you suggested, is that it's just not it's it's not a great look uh, for for the church to go into these places and build its most sacred edifices and to to create a lot of local conflict because of it. Now, now the church would say, look, we we this is in, especially in the United States, right? We have a First Amendment that, that protects free exercise. Um, we we have the right to build sacred buildings, just like the Methodists do, just like the Catholics do, just like the Hindus do, and 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 we do keep the rules. We work within city ordinances. We we work with those those uh, those kinds of people. We bend over backwards. Oftentimes, the the church does a lot of things to to do local improvements uh, in connection with temples. Um, and so I, I can see some frustration on the church's side. Um, but I also think that there needs to be concession and compromise where, where possible to recognize uh, that it can't simply just kind of assume that everybody's going to be OK with this very large building with a very tall steeple with lighting that goes late into the night uh, that, uh, that, the, that, that that I would hope that that as the church goes into these communities to build temples, uh, that it does so with humility and with with an attitude of bridge building and wanting the best possible solution for everybody. I think one of the big challenges the church faces uh, with we've already covered a number of the challenges, but it's the fact that the church likes to keep these things secret until they're announced. So it's not that you're going into Cody and talking about, hey, how would you feel about having a temple? And if so, where would you like it? What would the dimensions be? What would be the constraints? What would you like to approve? But because they come down from church headquarters as basically a surprise fiat, it catches uh, these communities, including Keeper Valley didn't know. Cody, Wyoming didn't yeah. know. And our next article here in Orem, the Orem, even in or, even in Utah, the Orem City Council, when the church announced that new Orem t t temple, which is right off the freeway, the Orem City Council tweeted out afterwards, wow, that's news to us. So <laughs> it, it, yeah. if you could coordinate these incredibly massive structures, which, you know, 
have a lot of resources. They require a lot of resources. They increase the traffic. They increase the visibility and all those things that you said. If you would, you know, just not be so intent upon having the secret surprise in general conference and would work behind the scenes, like most, you know, if Amazon comes into a community or if Walmart comes into a community, they usually lay the groundwork well in advance and talk to the planners and the city council and say, you know, what can we work with you? Church doesn't appear to really do that. I mean, they have, I, I know somebody who works on the temple, um, the, the, the temple scouting committee. They will go out and look at different plots. They will bring those plots to church headquarters and say, how do you feel about those? But they don't engage in the local community. And I think that that is what the real issue that we're, we're continuing to see is. Yeah, I, I I would agree with that. That that I think it's it's not enough just to own a piece of land and then build a huge building on it. Again, you you may be well within your rights to do so. You may uh, you know and 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 they've got all the lawyers and everybody you know telling them, okay, these are what the rules are in city X, Y, or Z. Uh, so we need to make sure we 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 stay within those uh, within those zoning ordinances. So, but but but. But that's not enough, right? It's it's not enough just to meet the kind of minimum legal requirements. To be a good neighbor means to to do more than that. To 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 be neighborly, to consult with people, to be transparent, uh, to 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 talk with people in the community. I mean, so 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 again, I mean, this is a house of the Lord. That this is a place where we worship the Prince of Peace. Why would we want temple building to be one of the preeminent wedges? that separates church members from their neighbors in all of these, dif these different places that puts local church members in actually a pretty tough bind that of course they're thrilled that they're going to get a temple locally, but now they've got targets on their back because everybody hates them because of what the church is doing. Right. And it divides communities. So I'd like to see, and, and some of this may be going on, right? So I, I certainly don't claim to know everything about this process of, of the way that they go in and do this. Uh, but it does seem to be, as, as you said, there's lots of reporting about key people being surprised by these announcements. I'd like to see a little more groundwork laid and, and neighborliness uh, and bridge building may be more important than surprise, you're getting a temple. <laughs> yeah, that's a surprise. Yeah, it's definitely a surprise. That much is for sure. You know, and um, the church is, you know, engaged in litigation in a couple of these temple areas, and they're almost assuredly going to win these lawsuits. I mean, yeah. the, the 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 federal law in particular is going to override these, whatever these city councils have as far as light restrictions or ordinances or things like that. The federal law that the church is going to the church is going to litigate these in federal courts, and the federal law is going to say that religious institutions in particular have a wide latitude in building structures almost however that they want, because we have the First Amendment of the Constitution, and all of these small little towns are um, could, could end up having a big bill and then end up with nothing. So I think that your sentiment there is very, very good. I, I would like to say that, um, you know, this isn't the only temple that's making the news. The new Orem Temple has also, um, it's just uh, the, the ground's been broken on it. We're starting to see tours. I just want to cue this up for you. Um, it's uh, paving the way here for the Provo Temple to also be demolished. Uh, let's play this clip and get some reaction on some more, shall we say, positive temple news here, Patrick. Free public tours of the new Orem Latter-day Saints Temple begin on Friday. The temple is the latest to be completed in Utah. And now that it's done, another longtime temple will be torn down. And people in the community sharing some mixed feelings. Daniel Woodruff now with the story. It's a busy day outside the Provo Temple. Families are saying goodbye to missionaries. Where are you going? Bolivia, Cochabamba, Bolivia. But when Andrew Watts gets back in two years, this temple won't be here. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints plans to demolish and rebuild it. This is what it will look like. I did not know that. I'm so excited to realize that and realize that we're so blessed to have this moment with him here. The Provo Temple was dedicated in 1972. Sitting on the city's east side, it served countless college students, missionaries, and members. It's a little shocking for me because there's so many memories, uh, like generations that we had here come through. The church says the Provo Temple will close on February 24th. They haven't said yet how long rebuilding it will take. There's several levels of just sadness for me, I think, and disappointment. Jen Bruton was married in the Provo Temple. She started a petition urging the church to preserve it rather than get rid of it. So many other temples right now are being given the love and care that I feel they deserve, and the Provo Temple is not. Outside the temple, Abaiki Wiongi says he understands the nostalgia, but he's excited to see what will be here. I'm glad it's being remade. It'll be a little sad to see it go, though. In 
Yeah, so Patrick, I mean, this is a beloved temple. Everyone who's gone on a mission went through this temple. I have so many memories. I grew up right next to this temple. Everyone has memories. Now, this isn't the, the church's most gorgeous temple. In fact, it usually appears uh, on, on the list of the ugliest temples. Right. So maybe that's why it's being demolished. But, you know, there's there's a lot of nostalgia that's associated with this temple. Does it really need to be torn down just because some people don't like how it looks? Well, I've got to imagine it's it's more than that. I've got to imagine that it's more than it's just the, the just an aesthetic decision. Again, I I don't know what the 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 internal conversations were. I, I have no doubt that it was a decision that was not made lightly, uh, just because of the pure expense of it. Uh, but uh, but but yeah, it's uh, you know it, it it is funny. I I've actually um, I've I've heard a lot more cri criticism of the Provo Temple than love for it. Um, until they announced that they were <laughs> going to demolish it and, and build something new. Uh, and certainly people have a lot of nostalgia for, you know, going there while they were in the MTC or getting married there. I, of, of course, I mean, if that's where you got married. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I suppose that, that I just have mixed feelings about this. I mean, no building stands forever. Uh, I mean, this building is not that old. Uh, I mean, you know, it's just, just 50 years old, but maybe there are, you know, just some really serious architectural issues or other kinds of things. And they just decided it was easier to start from scratch than to, than to remodel it entirely or gut it or something like that. So, uh, I don't think anybody wanted to save it as one of the architectural wonders of the world. And so, you know, Provoans are, are going to have a, a beautiful new temple, uh, within a few years. Uh, they've got two other temples with, well, they've got like a zillion temples within a half hour of them. Um, so I suspect that this is, you know, while, while there is some personal disappointment for this, and I don't want to diminish that, uh, within 10 years from now, uh, people are going to be really happy with the new temple that they get. I, I sure hope so. I, for one, am filled with a lot of angst. Uh, you know, the memories that I have inside the Provo Temple are very, very special to me, and I hold them very, very dear to my heart. And yeah. also goes along with the fact that the Salt Lake Temple, I know these buildings are old. They need seismic upgrades. I, I understand that. I know, as you said, no building can last for forever. But the character of these buildings is going to be drastically transformed. You know, yeah. I had Peter Bleakley, who runs a small YouTube channel called The Mormon Civil War, on this program, and he talked about how in Europe, you know, and in England, he's from over the pond, that they preserve their buildings in the same state. If they need to be remodeled, they keep the character of the building intact because that's so important. And what he said is that, you know, uh, the current administration of the church ripping down these sacred temples and then rebuilding them in an entirely new manner, the Salt Lake Temple is going to really resemble almost nothing the way that it is that it, that it looked before. It's going to have four total new floors underneath it. Nothing of it is going to, uh, very little of it is going to be the same. There'll be some minor architectural similarities on the outside, but it's like you're, you're tearing down the Vatican of Mormonism. How can you possibly just stand by and let these things happen, which are cultural icons to uh, to Latter-day Saints and, and have so many memories? How can we all just sit by and, and let this happen? And that really caused a lot of shame within my heart because I hadn't really realized, you know, these are very special. If we, In my opinion, if we need to remodel a temple, we should keep the character of it intact so that those memories are sustained. Any last thoughts on uh, temples here, Patrick? Yeah, well, I, I think that that those are great points, and and this is a uh, this is a um, you know a debate that that I think is longstanding uh, in terms of not only among architects and and professionals, but but just among all of us uh, for, who enjoy these buildings. Uh, and there's always this tension between utility versus aesthetics. Uh, it, it seems to be that that the, that the current first presidency leans towards utility. Right, these are buildings that are meant to be used, uh, and that they're they're meant to provide sacred ordinances for 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 God's children, and that's the most important thing above aesthetics, above anything else. Um, again, I'd, it would be great to have a both and solution, right? Uh, it would, it would be great to to have beautiful uh, uh, buildings that that aesthetically stood the test of time. I mean, let's let's frank it, let, let's be honest. Some of the the temples that were built in the 1960s and 70s with those aesthetics, those are not timeless aesthetics. This is not exactly neo gothic cathedrals uh, in in Europe. So 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 let's not. I don't want to confuse it and say like that every building is worth preserving in its original character forever. Uh, I uh, again, that's that's a judgment that I make, a, an aesthetic judgment that I make. Uh, that I think uh, you know, Chart Cathedral is more beautiful than the church office building, uh, and and so. But 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 these are these are honest and serious conversations that that, that we should be having. 
I, it, it would be great, uh, just like we talked about when they built a temple to go into communities and have those kinds of conversations. It would be really nice if they consulted with local Latter-day Saint communities when they started thinking about, you know, uh, changing and remodeling temples. I mean, I, I think about just the outcry, the appropriate outcry over the art in the Manti Temple that was going to be, you know, all those Minerva Tykert murals and so forth that are that are absolute cultural treasures um, that, that the, the church announced that, that it was going to get rid of, you know, and, and it took an outcry to, to save those things. And so, so yeah, that we could do so much better. The church could do so much better at communication and transparency and consulting, not only with external stakeholders, but with, you know, the, the members of the church. After all, we are the church. We are the body of Christ. It's not just, uh, people in the church, in church headquarters. Yeah, my favorite mural, which is in the Washington, D.C. temple, when the uh, fiat, basically a fiat came down in 2018, 2019 to get rid of all the murals. Virtually every mural in every single temple was taken down at that time, including my favorite mural, which is at the Washington, D.C. temple. So it's like these these special memories that I have, they're slowly being, I don't yeah. know, they're slowly being taken away from me. And that just it, it, there's a sad spot in my heart for that. And I know that the Provo, new Provo temple is going to be so much more beautiful. It's going to be so much more um, it's just going to be a lot better of a building. There's no doubt about that, but there's just a heritage. There's, there's a culture yep. that is somehow, somehow needs to be preserved. And I feel like it's slipping away through my fingers and I wish there was something I could do about it. I, I completely agree. I mean, I, I, I think we, we need to, to, to preserve unity and diversity, right. And, and to think about all of these different art forms and cultural forms in, in a global church, e even regionally, right. Manti is not the same as Logan. It's not the same as, uh, as, as Cody, Wyoming and, and just putting, you know, little motifs in the carpet is, is not exactly it. I mean, it, it would, I, I understand the, the desire to streamline. I understand the desire to have a kind of similar aesthetic wherever the church is. Lots of people for them, it's it's really meaningful to say I can go into an LDS church anywhere and have the same experience or I can go into an LDS temple anywhere and sort of feel like I'm at home. Um, uh, there's something to that. Uh, so I don't want to take that away. But but my goodness, we, you know, even. We're, we're a pretty young church. We're only 200 years, but we have created culture. We have created things of beauty. And so let's let's hold on to that culture and preserve those kinds of things, even while we move forward and, and create a, additional culture. Let's not just kind of wash everything out in some some kind of like bland early 21st century like aesthetic, because it's not going to stand the test of time either. Yeah, thanks for your thoughts there. Oh, you can find uh, the Mormon News Roundup. We're on Facebook. If you want to make a donation to our podcast, uh, we're on uh, Patreon. You can make a small donation if you feel like it. And that does take us to our final news article, which you found for us, uh, 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 Patrick. And can you walk us through what is the church don uh, what is the church doing in Florida as far as donating a million dollars? Yeah, it's another nice story. I mean, of 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 the church's humanitarian outreach, there's the million dollars to it to a Florida food bank that that they said is going to be able to provide over eight million meals to to, to local people. Uh, that's really significant. And uh, and you know, the obvious question is, well, the church could be doing more. You know, we 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 know about the church's vast resources and so forth. Uh, and and those are serious conversations. We need to have that conversation about how the church could do even more. But but I think it's also it's it's important to acknowledge to those people in Florida, those people who are going to get those eight million meals, they're very grateful for it, and they're not just sitting around and saying, "Why didn't you give us more?" Uh, that that million dollars, uh, and and there's going to be you know every week that the church is doing similar things like this around the world. So 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 let's do a both end. Yes, let's recognize that there's more to be done. Uh, and the resources are there for the church to to um, uh, to to make it a big and even bigger impact. Uh, but but let's also recognize that the truly a lot of people's lives are going to be blessed and the quality of life is going to be better for a lot of people in Florida because of the church's generosity. Yeah, a million dollars is a lot more than I've ever donated and ever will. <laughs> right. So the church needs to be given <laughs> mega kudos for that. You know, anytime we have a discussion of this, think about the church in 2021. Don't if you don't if you strip out the fast offering, which is I consider as a pass through church internal resources for donations would be one hundred million dollars in 2021 and two hundred million dollars in 2022, not including the fast offerings. That's an increase of 100 percent. So the church is definitely going in the right direction by leaps and bounds, not just by a small amount. But as you said, 
church donations versus the significant resources that Bishop Waddell talked about in that 60 minutes. We know that the church is the number one holder of real estate in the United States, approximately $110 billion. We know that Ensign Peak is probably in between 150 to $180 billion. The church has $300 billion in assets. And if you also think about how much money that the church brings in every single uh, every single year, six to seven thousand, uh, six to seven billion dollars in tithing, probably about ten billion dollars in Enzyme Peak, and we'll call it about another three billion in the church's commercial um, commercial uh, uh, commercial ventures. The church brings in twenty billion dollars per year. Uh, that's a, a very uh, conservative estimate. It's sitting on three hundred billion dollars. Well. $20 billion per year would be about $500 million a week. So the church is bringing in $70 million a day. So when we see a $1 million donation from the church, which is bringing in $70 million a day, we're putting this in the scale of what the church's resources are. So the, my, my question to you, Patrick, is should everyone just be glad that the church donates for these food banks you know, and other charitable causes without asking the natural follow-up question with its incredibly vast resources, why isn't the church donating more? Yeah, I, I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time here. I, I, I think we can say, yes, again, that's tremendous. Uh, those people's lives in Florida is, are going to be better uh, next week than they were last week uh, because of that generosity. And the church has capacity to, to, to do so much more and we should expect it to. Uh, and I'm personally grateful for all of the, re the reporting that's come out in the past year or two. Uh, uh, about the church's wealth. I mean, and this comes up periodically. This is not exactly the first time that anybody has ever uh, uh, said that the that the church is is a wealthy uh, organization. Um, but but the the increased attention, the increased scrutiny uh, that we're seeing right now, the call for greater transparency, and most importantly, uh, I, I I personally care less about transparency than I care about impact. Uh, and and so I want both. But if I had to choose between the two, uh, I would simply want the church to be doing more with its resources to do good for more of God's children. Uh, it certainly can. I suspect I don't know. I'm not I can't predict the future um, and I don't know exactly everything that's happening within church headquarters. But I suspect that all of this reporting has prompted a lot of soul searching and prompted some some hard and long conversations in church headquarters. So I, I suspect that the charitable giving and the humanitarian impact of the church will continually continue to increase, I hope, exponentially. And I, I think as a member of the church, uh, it's not just because it's my tithing. It's, it's not but for, for me. It's, it's not mine. As soon as I donate it and I've donated it not to the church, I'm doing it as, as a faith offering to God. Um, but 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 for me, uh, I, as, as somebody who's associated with the church, uh, I want it to have the greatest impact at possible uh, to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people uh, while also, you know, serving its its core mission. Yeah, without a doubt. When we, we've seen just in the last year, the church double its humanitarian donations, and I would not be surprised at all to see it double again. Nobody's ever satisfied with church total donations. They keep saying, well, there's going to, you got to have more, you got to have more. No one ever is satisfied. What is the number? You, there's a lot of critics out there. Okay. What is the number that the church has to donate yeah. in order to silence the critics? How much is it? Because the church just a couple of weeks ago donated $44 million. They're donating a million dollars here. They doubled the donations in the last year. What is the number? I think that that's a, that's a fair question. Yeah, for folks I, I think ask. it's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you the know, the number is north of 1 million. I'll tell you that. <laughs> 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 yeah, definitely north of uh, 1 million. Uh, Patrick, I want to thank you so much for coming onto our podcast. You know, your latest book here is Proclaim Peace, The Restoration's Answer to an Age of Conflict. You know, what do you have, uh, what projects do you have lined up in the future, either at uh, Utah State University, additional books or other ventures? Yeah, so so a lot of things. So one actually connected to this. I'm really involved here at the Utah State University. We just created a new peace institute. It's called the Harabi Peace Institute. So a lot of what I'm doing is is helping train the next generation of peace builders uh, to come out of Utah State University. I'm really excited about that. In terms of my own writing and and scholarship, I'm I'm writing a book about Ezra Taft Benson right now. Uh, I'm helping uh, co-edit a volume about some of the, the radical strains in, especially in early uh, 19th century Mormonism. So I've always got a lot of irons in the fire uh, and just, just glad to be able to do what I do. Well, it's been tremendous having you on. You know, new episodes of the Mormon News Roundup are released every Sunday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you join us on YouTube, you can interact with your humble host and our hosts here. I want to give a shout out to Weird Alma 
who provides the uh, music for this episode. And uh, thanks so, so much, uh, Patrick, for ruminating with me on the great spacious beehive, as I like to call it. And remember, remember. That no unhallowed hand can stop this podcast from progressing. So long. When it comes to nicknames of the church, such as LDS Church, the Mormon Church, to remove the Lord's name from the Lord's Church is a major victory for Satan. 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 Satan.